That is hot. Hot right now. There's like explosions everywhere. Ah! It's okay, you guys. It's okay. Oh my god. Oh my god. The last thing I remember hearing Daniel say was, "Don't worry, I'm gonna find you." We have a real problem. Small towns being incinerated by wildfires we cannot stop. I had to walk away from everything that we have ever known. Six of the seven largest wildfires in state history have happened in the span of just a year. The idea that we can fireproof this huge landscape. That's impossible when you've got thousands of homes in the fire's path. So I'm glad we got out with our lives, you know. It's the most important thing. Residents are now left wondering if there's anything that can be done to keep their communities safe. The research that has gone on for the last 30 plus years shows us that we're going in the wrong direction. Our ancestors included regular cycles of burning. I do not fight fire, I light fire. Wildfires, they're part of an ecological stimulus that rejuvenates the landscape. We don't have to live in a concrete ammo bunker to be able to control wildfires. I didn't spend decades learning about all of this to not have people use the science. In a few short years, we could maybe eliminate the communities being destroyed by wildfire. It's a sacred obligation to bring fire back to the land. And give us the blessing of fire. We have huge opportunity. We wanted to live in the forest. We didn't expect the forest to adapt to us. That was the trailer for the feature documentary, Elemental. And this is Factual America. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. Elemental takes viewers on a journey to better understand fire, the kind of fire that engulfs entire towns and plunges communities into a version of hell previously unimaginable. But it doesn't have to be this way. That's what Trip Jennings found out when he made this film. Join us as we talk with Trip, director and writer of Elemental, about his journey investigating wildfires, documenting harrowing escapes, and finding simple solutions to big problems. The secret is in the little things. Stay tuned. Trip Jennings, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? Oh, um, they're fine. I have COVID, um, yes. and it was my first time. Um, so I'm in the club now, and I'm happy uh, to have mostly gotten through it. But I'm on day 10, and day 9 was my worst. So it, it was actually it was kind of rough. But I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I feel like this means I'm done with it. Well, we're happy to help you get through uh, to the to the other end of the of the COVID saga. I mean, you and I were actually sharing beforehand. Uh, I just had COVID for the first time, sort of a few weeks ago. Um, so, did you? Oh, are you now you are more likely to be. Well, obviously, you're more likely to be the last person in the world to get COVID. But do you feel like that? Is that to, is how are your friends and family responding? You know, it's is it still sympathetically somehow. Okay. But it's because my whole family got COVID at the same time. So I oh. think everyone was just like, oh, you have a child. Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> exactly. It exactly. sounds awful. Yeah, so. I w uh, small child? Because I, mean, I wouldn't want to, I mean, Two. at least, oh, God. Yeah, okay. So that's worse than, like, being hungover and trying to look after a ch Not that I've ever done that necessarily, but... Uh, of course Yeah, not. yeah, of course not. No. Of course not. We'd never do something like that. But, yeah, at least mine are older, so I could just kind of lie in He's bed all day guy, for a few days. Yeah. yeah, right. No, you've got to, like... I mean, even if you want to use the screen babysitter, it only works for so long. And then it right. gives him bad dreams at night, scary dreams from watching a movie. We were at, we watched Miyazaki, and he um, oh. loved it. <laughs> yeah, but but he he uh, had bad dreams that night. So yeah, it kind of backfires. No, it's rough. Yeah, <laughs> With a kid. I, th I thought you were going to say how people did it in the beginning. Exactly, because the thing is, what what I had to keep telling myself is, it, what I remember thinking three years ago, this was far better than what you know. Let's face it, and many people did go. I mean, it was horrible for obviously for a lot of people, and there was a lot of people 
died from it. But uh, you oh, know, yeah. uh, having yeah. I don't know if you're vaccinated or not, but you know the the obviously they've done their done the job, and it's uh, yeah, it wasn't great, uh, and it gave us something to complain about, and you're still able to complain about it now. And I can tell you, even yesterday, something happened that made me think: is this still COVID hanging around for a little bit? But uh, not to yeah. make you feel bad, but but uh, but yeah, it, it, all things considered, it could have been a lot worse. So oh yes, yeah. we should be. And I'm so glad. I mean, it you know it wasn't that bad for a family. It's it wasn't fun, but I'm so grateful that people are you know back in theaters. Um, exactly, film festivals have yeah. people at them again. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, and I think 2023. People are are far more comfortable than even twenty twenty two. At least we've been seeing that. So yeah, it's nice. No, that's great, and uh, and uh, that brings us back to uh, why we're why we're here. We want to talk about your film that's uh, well, technically released last year, but is uh, having a theatrical release now. We're talking about Elemental. Um, you can also check it out. Uh, check out the website elementalfilm dot com, and you say it's going to be streaming. Is it sometime in June? June thirteenth. Yep. Okay. And where can people find it? It'll be on sort of all the all usual. the platforms, right? Okay. Yeah, all the usual. So Apple and Amazon, and uh, the list will go on okay. your favorite spots. Okay. Well, why don't you tell uh, tell our listeners uh, what is Elemental all about? Wow, it's a great question. So I I think of Elemental as the way that we will all be talking about wildfire in five years, right? Mm -hmm. Wildfire, um, as the world warms, we have longer dry spells Mm -hmm. and we have more of the sort of hydro whiplash, right? So it rains a bunch in the winter and then it gets way drier than normal. Um, And it's just leading to more acres burned and far more homes and structures burned, right? And I think that we're just running up against a wall where we can't continue doing the same thing that we're doing. We can't continue seeing entire communities burned down. Mm. Um, And I think I was tired of that. I was tired of sort of hearing that we were doing everything we could and we should do more of the thing that's not working. Mm. And uh, I spent five years researching it. And so Elemental takes us on my journey. And um, I really do believe this is the direction that the wildfire conversation is going. Mm. And it is hopeful. It's it's unlike most climate-oriented films that, um, you know, you end kind of just bummed out. There are solutions. Mm. This is something that we can actually solve, I believe, in relatively short order. But we have to choose to do it. I mean, I think you make a a very good point. I mean... um... And I'm just curious, what did, I mean, you, you said five years in the making. What did you, what did you know about fire, forest fires going into the film? Because mm. cause you pack in a lot in just over 80 minutes in this film, I will say. And that's yeah, meant as a compliment. So, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad. So yeah. um, I, did, I did create a student film about wildfire um, in, you know, I think it was 20, 2006, maybe. Okay. Um, and so that was a long time ago, obviously, and I was a student, and uh, it wasn't exhaustive in any way, but uh, I knew, I, I think, like, just enough about wildfire that I remembered and, you know, that had carried, carried over, I guess, mm-hmm. um, to the point that when a fire um, ignited about 40 miles east of Portland, and okay. Eastwind was blowing it towards Portland, and it was kind of the first time in recent generations that ashes had been falling on homes and cars in Portland. We had mm. to clean our windows and windshields. Um, and people were freaking out, especially because this fire was burning in a place that's just so beloved by Portlanders. The right. Columbia River Gorge, it's, it's a mm. beautiful old-growth forest. Um, and it's where we love to go hiking and recreate. It's like one of the reasons right. that people live in Portland. Yeah. And um, I just began to realize that the discourse, the sort of like public outcries and the way that politicians and policymakers were talking about fire mm. was pretty far from what I believed was the best available science. 
Mm. Um, and so I started to get into it. Um, I got the first uh, temporary, the first ex exclusion um, permission to go into the uh, closed airspace over the fire and fly over it because they said 40,000 acres of burned. And I was like, you know, I bet, I bet it doesn't look like that. I bet, I bet way mm -hmm. fewer acres actually burned hot, you know? Right. And so shot right. the front cover of the um, local paper, yeah. made a little film about it. And, and it really, you know, got a lot of people talking and thinking. And I thought, okay, I think we need to go deeper into this. Um, and at that point, I really actually, I thought I was going to make a very different film. I thought I was going to make an extremely different film than what, what we turned out making um, on the first shoot, which was about, you know, prescribed fire. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I thought we were going to make a film about the importance of fire on a landscape and how we need to put more of it on the ground. Right. And that is part of the film. However, on that shoot, one of the scientists said to me, well, prescribed fire is good. You know, it's an ecological benefit. But what you do more than 100 feet from a structure doesn't really have very much to do with whether or not it burns in a fire. Mm. And I was like, like nothing, like all of the prescribed, all of the thinning, everything that we're doing. And I was like, that guy's for sure wrong. And... Um, <laughs> I spent basically <laughs> five years right. proving him right. Yes. Yeah. Learning why I was wrong. And so that's the process of the film. And that's, that's what you see. Um, well, th that's a very interesting journey because it, it certainly, um, because I was going to ask you, I mean, did you have any idea what you were going to discover? I mean, I mean, cause what you, when I said you cr a lot in there, I mean, it's uh, it's investigative journalism. It's a, it's an element of nature docs, if you will. There's, a, you know, there's a call to action, I would say. And, uh, and it's an environmental piece, obviously, which is obviously the backdrop to, to climate change. Everything's behind this. But, I mean, what struck me is it seems to me we just got, we as a, as a society, um, keep getting things wrong. I mean, we just seem to be wrong about everything about fires, about how to fight them, about forests, about how to build our houses, how to, where to build our houses. I mean, is that a, is, that's a pretty fair uh, summation, would you say? Well, I think that it's very true when we look at, you know, especially how we adapt to climate change um, and, mm. and how we, you know, but it makes sense to me too, right? Mm. Like there's that great quote that's, you can't use the same thinking to get yourself out of a problem that you used to create the problem, right? Right, right. And problems, I think, are created often by stories, mm -hmm. by narratives. We do something that we believe will work well, and we try it out, and we invest in this narrative, and um, it's difficult to change that narrative, and mm -hmm. so we continue doing it too long. And it causes problems, and we have to adapt and change, right? right? And we're not native. Most of us, the overwhelming majority of us, are not native to the places that we live, right? right. right. And so what we did in the film is we, we combined, and I think this is a sort of an unusual thing about a film like this, mm. um, but we combined what I believe is the best available science mm. um, with knowledge from people who have never been displaced, never been extirpated from their homeland. The Yurok people, Native Americans in Northern California. And it is unusual. It's, it's very rare. Like most um, tribes hmm. through colonization have been displaced and have been forced to leave True. their land. True. Um, and so we do get this pretty magical, special window. And in Northern California, it was one of the last places to be colonized. And in fact, people kind of at, at one point were like, you know, you all just stay there. Not mm -hmm. that there wasn't massive oppression and we covered that a bit in the film, but, right. um, but the fact is that we have a lot to learn from people who have since time immemorial, you know, since the last ice age, mm. uh, you know, could have been there. And so um, combining that knowledge of that place that's so deep with, uh, you know, the best available science, um, I think does it gives us a path forward. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like there's this. I mean, as you say, um, most of us. And I'm I'm from the states originally. I mean, we're not 
you know, we don't have a direct contact to, uh, you know, the people who've lived there uh, all along, you know, d- direct connection. But uh, it's almost like as a society, as a culture, we, we have this sort of societal amnesia. Or, uh, and there are all these things that, uh, I mean, it kind of makes sense, too, for me. I mean, it, it personally, it's just that uh, yeah, we've kind of lost touch as a culture and society with nature and how to interact sure. with it. And absolutely. Um, so things that people, and then there are two, I mean, back to this point you were also making, I mean, it's, it's also sort of that what the prevailing narrative is, it's also something starts with an assumption and people don't question that assumption or it didn't for a while. And now they are questioning those assumptions and your film does and realize that, uh, you know, you start with the wrong assumption. You're going to go in the wrong, you're definitely going to go in the wrong direction. Yeah. You know, and I think that we, I think that's for sure true. And that's part of it. I also think that we shouldn't beat ourselves up too much about it because we created a society that worked in Mm. a climate and a weather pattern that we got used to for generations. And then what we did changed it. But, but the underlying fact is that the weather and the climate changed, right? Like, I've also reported on dams and, you know, also Mm. flooding, um, drought. And the thing that keeps coming up is that we designed systems and infrastructure for a climate that we don't live in anymore. Yeah. Right. So, and climates shift on their own. We also shift the climate, obviously. And so we shouldn't be, I mean, yeah, we shouldn't be too upset with ourselves in some ways, like we should have mm. some some grace and some forgiveness for ourselves because, <laughs> um, you know, we designed our communities. We pushed out into the wildlands, mm-hmm. and we said, "Boy, is it nice to live amongst nature." Yeah. Um, yeah. And we built, and that's that's been the fastest growing sort of sector of homes mm. over the last couple decades for obvious and important reasons, right? We like being among the trees and. Mm. And, and, and importantly, grasslands and shrublands um, as well. And they weren't burning. Right. In the 60s right. and 70s and even into the 80s, it was kind of fine. Like firefighting worked yeah. and we make yeah. that point in the film. Yeah. But now it doesn't. Yeah. The climate has changed. The amount of um, potential ignition sources have changed. Mm. Um, and we're in a predicament. And so we can't use the same tools to protect ourselves that we could back then. And so we have to evolve. We have to change. Um, Cause we, I mean, honestly, we don't have choice. Yeah. I, I think that's a, I want to give our listeners a very quick early break and we'll be right back with uh, Trip Jennings, the uh, director and writer of Elemental. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with Trip Jennings, the director and writer of Elemental. We were talking about uh, how things, not beating ourselves up, and I think that's a very good point, and I think what's also a good, what it also illustrates is how, and I think, as you've mentioned already, this is a film that's, uh, you know, the problem with a lot of, some environmental films is that they're all doom and gloom. And uh, I know we've had some, some people on to talk about this previously. Um, and it, in some ways it causes some of us or many of us to just sort of freeze in our tracks and say, well, what can we do about things? And yet yours is very positive, very uplifting. I mean, I, I was also reminded of a um, professor I had who said, well, there's no beach erosion problem. It's just a problem because humans want to live near the beach. Uh, which is true, but you know you're not telling us off for building houses and beautiful places, and you know it's just. And as you've pointed out, uh, and I'm older than you, and I have kind of been caught off guard too. Uh, I don't remember there being that many forest fires, and there being lots of problems. And then I moved away f- of about 20 years ago, and then lo and behold, as you've as you document and it certainly start off the film, it's like every year it gets worse and worse, and the worst fires are of the, you know, all the worst events are all in the last five to ten years. 
Um, and so we are in a different world. And so, I mean, maybe, maybe the best way, uh, what, what have you, I guess, how do we break this down and, and not give away too much because people should see the film, but uh, I mean, what have you, in doing this journey, um, what's the main thing, I guess, you've discovered about forest fires that you think? In the, uh, well, in the- here's, here's my favorite quote. Um, from a scientist that, uh, that ended up in the narration of the film mm. um, is that uh, forest fires aren't really the problem yeah. because only 20% of homes that burn in California are in forests. Right. right. So right. think about that. We yeah. call them forest fires, right? Um, yeah. But grass yeah. fires, yeah. chaparral, Wildfires, uh, what are, yeah, it's well, yeah, wildfires. So, yeah. I mean, I think wildfires is a great way to say it, but when I say I make a film about wildfire, people are like, Oh, I think they're like, like, Is that it's like a type of campfire? Or I, you know, I don't even know. Um, and then I'm like, Forest fires, and they're like, Oh, yeah, forest fires. And I kind of like have to scratch my head because I'm like, It's 80% of them, you know, 80%. Like, we could pave every forest in the United States. <laughs> We could cut down every tree, right? And right. you would only solve twenty percent of the problem. Right. And of course, we shouldn't do that because forests, on the other hand, are one of our most important allies mm. in this. They're most one of our most important tools. And so, I, I think that in blaming forests, which we kind of inadvertently do when we call them all forest fires, um, we're blaming you know this potential tool, this important resource mm. to, if we manage them well, to store carbon, to cool the climate. And, and you know, I think one of the most important things without giving away too much, uh, you know, is that, yeah, when we define this as a problem that's in the forest or even in the back country, mm. um, as opposed to w- a problem of the things that we want to stop burning, I mean, that's the problem. And that's where we have to reimagine. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and I wish I could say it was the like sexy, exciting things. We have this <laughs> desperate desire to like right. fight right. thing, fight problems. And also I think to, to think there's 200 foot flames and that's what we have to mm. fortify our homes with. Mm. Um, but when we focus from the home out, uh, it turns out we can live in pretty normal houses as mm. long as we focus on the little things. And that's actually true. You know, I, I also produced a show for PBS okay. um, about extreme weather, climate, how it's changing, and how we can prepare, right? So looking at like almost like elemental, but for multiple threats. And the thing that I realize across the board is that there are big things we need to do in this climate adaptation, which is, of course, decrease carbon pollution. Right. But with the way that we design and build and protect our homes and our communities, it's kind of these details and that's what we get mm. wrong. Mm. I think you said earlier, you know, we kind of get all of it wrong. We, get, we do the opposite thing. And I think we have this emotional response to the big problem and we want to stop the big problem, the 200 foot flames that are far away from our homes. But yeah, it's the little things on our homes that keep them from going away. Well, before we even start talking about the little things in the homes, I mean, the thing that is, is you also point out, billions of dollars are spent on firefighting and, you know, these ama- in armies, basically, of firefighters that we have throughout the West of the United States and certainly in California. Um, but yet, I think, wasn't there another stat, something to the effect that uh, it's only 2% of the fires that actually have, you know, so you were talking about this 80-20 split. Well, then yeah. there's also this 98-2 split in that most of the forest fires don't have any sort of, um, you know, or I, I don't know, I wouldn't say that they don't have a threat, but they're not, they're really, we don't need to be worrying about that, that 98%. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, firefighters are extremely effective. Yeah. They're extremely good at what they do, right? Yeah. We put, as you say, we put out 98% of, fire, of fires at initial attack, right? They don't get bigger. Some of them get the size of a dinner plate. Some of them get the, uh, you know, an acre, right. 10 acres. Um, and they don't burn a home down and they don't make the news. Thank goodness. Right. And that's, that's 
almost 98% of fires, which is great news, except yeah. for the fact that those 2% that do escape are getting bigger and they're causing more destruction. Mm. And, you know, as Jack Cohen, who's one of the stars of the film, points out, right. um, when we try to stop the problem by just doing more firefighting, we are trying to stop the the tails, the extreme end, the most mm. difficult fires to change the outcome from just firefighting. Um, and it's not working, you know, it's getting worse. It's getting right. worse and worse. And so, so just to be clear, uh, I don't, I, you know, there's not a world in which we have um, success and we have less firefighting or we start right, right. taking funds away from firefighters. Right, right. They're doing, they're doing important heroic work. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but the other stat, the mm. other sort of 80, 20 like stat yeah. is, um, is that the overwhelming majority of money that we spend that's not on firefighting that's on pre preparing for fire, preparing our homes and communities for fire. Um, something like 96, 97, um, 98% of that goes to vegetation management. And I think right, that's right. what we can see. It's not working. Right. It's not helping. The insurance industry um, and all sorts of scientists are pointing to what we spend that 2% on is homes and communities. And that's, that's what really makes the difference. And so back to those little things that you're saying that are important to... Um, so was it Jack uh, Cohen who was at the beginning that you said that he made that comment and you were like, you don't necessarily... No, it wasn't Jack. No, no it wasn't. Okay. No, I, you know, I actually don't remember who it was. I wish I did. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> but uh, I met Jack. So, so Jack is amazing. Jack uh, spent his whole career doing this work. And doing the science to yeah. help us understand the ideas of defensible space. Mm -hmm. He basically created, he did the experiments that created um, the idea of defensible space. Um, he helped understand the modern, you know, come up with the modern understanding of how fire moves and burns homes down, which is by throwing embers, most of it. Right. Um, and, and started to look at how we actually, can we just change little things in a house that changes its ignitability. Right. Um, it turns out the answer was yes. But he spent his entire career working for the Forest Service, and a lot of it with his results and findings being largely ignored. Mm. Um, and so he was pretty reluctant to kind of come out of his shell and mm. hang out with me. Um, he was pretty skeptical at first, mm. and he was pretty guarded. And I can appreciate all of those reasons. So it took three years um, and a bunch of trips to Missoula, where he lives. Um, and I'm really proud to say that now, um, I mean, he, he calls it our film. He's like, <laughs> you know, he's really into it and he's really been pushing yeah. it hard. Um, and, you know, when there's been any sort of questioning and pushback on the film, you know, he's like, no, 35, 30 years of of uh, research, are, you know, are behind this film. This is the real deal. And, and I'm, so I'm very, I'm flattered by that. That's one of my, I think, successes. <laughs> well, and you've got some, I mean, uh, I gather he's retired from the Forest Ser Service, but he's, uh, you've got some great footage there from his time there. I mean, he was, uh, I mean... I mean, it's incredible stuff that he's doing. You know, whole stands of for you know, wooded uh, land that he's basically setting on fire with a flamethrower and uh, yeah. testing. You know, these things <clears throat> to you know, and probably he was the only one thinking these. You know, even thinking right. these things. And, and isn't that just like the documentarian dream, right? Where you have this yeah. sort of cult hero of right. of like firefighters and fire scientists um, who did this research that was sort of suppressed or at least not highlighted mm -hmm. um and you go into some vault in a lab in missoula and you unearth you know the like really sadly i don't know like early digital mini dv right. tapes or whatever and you're like ah bring these to light finally right yeah um and and not only that it's not just about it's not just footage that's like uh some boring sciencey stuff. He's he's literally burning entire blocks of forest with 
gallons of jelly gasoline right, right. delivered from a flamethrower in the back of a forest service truck it looks exactly. like you're driving like 30 miles an hour on these yeah it's pretty cool and you've <laughs> even got guys like running like it looks like their, their lives are in danger yeah yeah you know, yeah, yeah. You know. I mean that footage because right because they were like they were like putting the cameras in these temperature controlled yeah. cases and then putting them in the fire and I, I mean maybe you could do those experiments maybe but I don't think so I mean you know we're now seeing huge forest fires in the locations where they did those tests I don't know if you could do that anymore today yeah. Yeah. and thank goodness we we have that research yeah I mean I don't don't want to make light of this, but there's this part of it that's even just like you kind of want to channel my inner Beavis and Butthead and just go fire, you know, kind of thing. Because oh, yeah. it's it's that kind of well, it's that kind of stuff that's happening, you know. And I, I mean, you've, humans aren't so drawn to fire, even when yeah. it's extremely destructive, right? Like, we, fire is the reason that our brains are the size that they are. If it wasn't for fire, we mm. would never have evolved to be the creatures that we are. And then, you know, continuing to use fire has allowed us, I mean, everything in our society, right? Like combustion engine. Is right, right. Everything. So, so yeah, we're, we are moths drawn to a fire, <laughs> and we are powerless against it. And I don't think that we should feel bad, even when we're looking at destruction. It's just innate. Yeah. And so, I mean, the other incredible stuff you've got is this, uh, is this, this institute that does all the, you know, it's this massive, like, yeah. Aircraft hangar. It's huge. Massive thing. Uh, what does he it's have? What do they have? Like, they can, like 150 yeah, fans say, or something? Yeah, you know, it's, just, a, it's a lot of fans. <laughs> I mean, they actually do control burnings of houses <laughs> in within this structure. I mean, this is incredible. Uh, yeah, they can create hur hurricane force winds. They Basically, the whole place exists to build and destroy homes and video it from all different angles, inside, right. outside, slow-mo, um, to learn what the weak points are. Yeah. And they do that. And so, so we went and we watched them burn a bunch of houses down, and it was uh, pretty fascinating. And we got to be you know, right there. And this is you know, part of something that Jack Cohen helped build and develop. Yeah. And, uh, well, and, it, and it proves, I mean, not that you had the proof and everything, but it, it further proves this point. Right. And, uh, and then you have real life proof. And I guess that kind of, it, you, it's five years in the work. So you were filming well ahead of when COVID hit, right? Um, yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> but then at the same time, you, I mean, it, there, you can tell that you were f f uh, safely, I'm sure. And I know because there are scenes where you've got people with like uh, wearing face masks and things. So you did obviously had to continue some filming over during the, uh, COVID, but, uh, you know, so you were, you started what, 2017, 2018? No, 2018. Yeah. I think yeah. we, I mean, we, we, yeah, 2017, I guess, but we didn't use any of the footage from 2017 because it just wasn't good. But, um, yeah, in earnest in like spring of 2018. And I guess doing the work and the research, you probably, probably weren't surprised, but at the same time, over this time period, you capture, I mean, you have the Labor Day fires in Oregon that were in 2020. I mean, the Boulder fires. I mean, I even have a friend who's lost a house in the Boulder fires in 21. I yeah. mean, um, uh, you were f already filming in areas that ended up burning down, like some of the research that uh, I forget one of the scientists right. was doing. Yeah. Um, I mean, you had no idea. You were, do you have any idea you're going to be able to capture all this going in? Um, I, you know, I don't think that you can um, do like natural history, mm. wildlife, uh, you know, natural phenomenons like fires. I don't think you can kind of do that kind of film work yeah. without uh, real being very overly optimistic about what you can capture. Right. Um, right. And so I'm, I'm just always, uh, I don't know, I guess I'm sort of constantly disappointing myself <laughs> because I'm like, oh, we can get everything, you know. Right, but, right. But without <laughs> thinking that way, I don't think you get it. So... Yeah, so I, I actually uh, I took the classes and I, I got um, firefighter certification. Um, okay. I, I got all my like PPE for um, being in fires and found myself very deep in you know in wildfires in California. Oh, and wow. um, and yeah, we took we spent years uh, 
filming some of the time lapses, filming the wildlife, um, some of the owl shots, you know, endangered species of owls that right. took, I mean, that, you know, almost two years to fully get mm. some of those scenes just because uh, we found the owls before they had mated, you know, and yeah. just a single dude. And then eventually we're able to f film um, his chicks flying for right. the first time. Wow. Well, that's... And then that's the thing. I mean, you were, again, um, many films would have just maybe just focused on the fire, but you've got, uh, or focused on the wildlife side of things, but you've, you've got, uh, you, you com combined an incredible amount of uh, different uh, aspects of this issue uh into into the film and it's in some incredible footage as, as you've as you've noted uh i mean are you if if a fire broke out near your home now you are licensed to go in there and and train to 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 f fight the fire if have had to be yeah i mean i don't think that yeah i don't uh, thankfully firefighting is very well organized right I'm, so i don't yeah. think that they're um right. calling on just anybody and uh <laughs> you don't want to I, you know, I, I hope that at some point we all prepare our homes and communities right. and we all are helping fight fires um, because we've reduced our risk, but boy, we're not there. So so I, yeah. I just learned enough to, um, well, I held a drip torch with the Iraq. I got to yeah. light a forest on fire, which was awesome, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, I, I got, I, but I, I just like to get my hands in it, yeah. you know? And so, um, uh, I mean, what is, I mean, people need to watch the film and they'll have an opportunity either uh, in, a, in a theater or a cinema or, uh, you know, streaming in, in June. But, uh, I mean, what is any key takeaways in terms of what we can do in terms of if for those people who potentially are affected, what can we do for our homes to, yeah. what, you well. know, to, to make them, you know, to lessen the risk, if you will. Totally. Um, you know, I think that the message of the film, the overall message of the film is that um, we don't have to fundamentally change forests all across the country in order to decrease our risk to wildfire. We can do a lot of the things that need to happen in a weekend project. We can start, you know, uh, I don't know how old your kids are, but you probably... Uh, they're probably old enough to go out there and start helping you with it, right? If you were in a right. fire-prone area. Yeah. I mean, it's things like boring, non-sexy details that we should think of as doing important climate adaptation work, mm -hmm. right? We shouldn't be thinking about, um, about oh, it's just, you know, a drudgery. And, you know, we, I mm -hmm. think we should be thinking about these things as how we adapt as a society to climate change, which is the challenge of, of mm. all of the generations that are present right now on earth, right? And so, so that said, it is, I mean, I'm talking about taking mesh screens to cover up vents of, for your attic. I'm talking about mm. uh, putting covers on your gutters so that you don't have kindling just right. accumulating right. in them, right? And I'm talking about switching the relationship, and this is a hard one for a lot of people, but switching the relationship between your garden beds and your walkways, right? We need mm. to have a five foot non-combustible perimeter immediately surrounding the house, the entire house. We love to have our garden beds up against our house. It's nice. Mm. We've gotten used to that. But if you could just move those garden beds five feet away and put river stones, put concrete walkways, um, put flagstones, whatever you want to put there, right? It can be very nice looking. But these are the things that take literally a weekend to do some of this stuff. Right. Um, some of the bigger things, I mean, if you have a, uh, if you still for some reason have a wood shingle roof, you got to get rid of that if you're in a fire prone area. Mm -hmm. And so many places are fire prone now and becoming more so. Mm -hmm. um, if you have uh, single pane windows, this is a great double dip, right? Temperatures are becoming more extreme. We need to get better insulation, our value out of our windows. And yeah. a single pane window, of course, windy um, fires are the most dangerous fires. Hmm. Wind throws sticks, throws rocks, throws whatever at your windows, right? 
if you have one pain break and an ember gets inside, it burns your home from the inside out, right? So multi-pane tempered glass, that's an expensive one, not a weekend project, but right. something worth saving up for to right. protect your entire home and all your memories. So it's these little things. I want to tell one little story about, about how to think about this, which is um, we interviewed these folks in Paradise, California, that burned to the ground. Yes. They stayed. They didn't evacuate during the fire. I don't recommend this. Mm-hmm. But they had a plan, and they did it. They had 200 feet of garden hose. And with that, they protect, protected their house and three neighbors' houses. And long after the fire front had passed, they watched a house catch from a little ember that had been somewhere you know, stuck in the house, mm-hmm. being fanned by wind for hours they watched on the corner across the street too far away from them to reach with their hose the house burned down it ignited burned onto the ground at the end it ignited the wood fence that wood fence wicked the flames over to their na- the neighbor across the street it burned that house down and then eventually caught the other side of the wood fence on fire and they watched 20 or so houses burn one by one because they just couldn't get in there and intervene and, and put the fence fire out, right? So it's the little things. Right. And, and you know, every home is obviously so, I mean, it's, it's someone's life that is just, a, you know, five years, a decade taken away right. of, of the rebuild of all of that. But it's also the toxic smoke. It's the trees that we have to cut down to rebuild. So I like to think of all of this as sort of climate adaptation um, that you can do in a weekend. You can be part of the solution in a weekend. Take down the five feet next to your house of your fence and put metal up instead. Yeah, and I think that's a very good point. I think it's. Uh, I think the reality is we're going to have to, as much as we've got to do what we can to uh, limit global warming. We are also. It's that genie. <laughs> is out of the bottle and that ship sailed. So we do also need adaptation. And as you point out, all these little things are actually helping with, with yeah. the fight. Is yeah. That- and, and I think, it, you know, we can't, we shouldn't be saying, oh, well, you know, without, when it comes to climate change, when it comes to carbon yeah. pollution, um, our individual actions are important, but they are not, you know, they're not the mm-hmm. solution, right? They are not, our individual actions are good to reduce our own carbon footprint, but really we need massive um, society scale right. changes. These are things that will legitimately help mm-hmm. you and the climate, I think, in the long run, that are small changes you can make in a weekend to your house. It's pretty cool. I, it's it's extremely cool, and uh, the little things are important in life, and uh are you seeing evidence that this is starting to happen, that people are taking this on board and, and doing these oh, yeah. things? Yeah. Yeah, and not just on an individual level. Like I see <clears throat> I see the beginnings of it. It's starting to yeah. become cool. It's like starting to trend. People are like, oh, we should do this. We should do this. Right. And, right. and so I think that the early adopters are into it. That's right. good. That's part right. of it becoming adopted. But right. we're also seeing from the top, we're seeing insurance companies – um, in places mm-hmm. where you can't get market rate insurance if you're in a certain area with a certain risk, we're seeing um, new certifications mm-hmm. come out that if you do all of the things, you have a third party verify it, that suddenly you can get like four times cheaper insurance um, at market rate. So that's a, mm-hmm. that's a huge boon, big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we're seeing, you know, uh, we're also seeing People understand, I think, more and more that um, it's worth doing. Yeah, and I think you know, as people lose insurance, which is a sort of a new thing over the last handful of years, yeah. you you know, we're seeing the potential risk of kind of gutting a lot of middle class wealth mm. yeah. because people who can't get insurance can't sell their home for as much, right? And so the fact that there's this, there's sort of this both carrot and stick right. thing happening. Um, so yeah, I'm actually really excited. I think that it's happening. I think we need to see, what we need to see is more public support, public dollars. We need mm-hmm. to put the money that we would put into, you know, things that are working not as well, that are not right. as effective right. into this. 
Um, but it's happening. It's happening. And I want people to watch the film so they understand how important it is. Well, uh, exactly. And uh, well done. And thanks thanks for that. And uh, actually, we're coming to the end of our time together, uh, Trip. But uh, before I let you go, I mean, back to the sort of the, the making of the film, um, I know it was... Uh, how did you end up getting uh, David Oyelowo to uh, do the narration? That's that's quite a coup, isn't it? Man, he is... <clears throat> the first time that I heard him say wildfire in the narration, <laughs> I just got shivers on my spine and I was so happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just like, oh, we got the right guy. Yeah. Um, he lives in LA. He lives in Tarzana, a neighborhood in LA. Yeah. He looks over uh, a hill right. that leads to wildland. land. He, yeah. he told us when we approached him that he could see wildfires pretty frequently. Like most years he can see yeah. wildfires and he was just wondering when one was going to get too close, right? And he was in the middle of um, doing some renovations on his home, and he watched our film, and he said, hey, contractors, can we do some of this stuff to our home? Um, mm. And so I think we approached him at uh, a time when he had a need, you know, a need to understand what to do about wildfire. And uh, I think he was just like, yeah, this is important stuff. So did you have a different narrator before? Oh, just me. Okay. <laughs> it was never going to be me. I was just the scratch, the okay. scratch narrator, yeah. Right. But he's, then he saw a cut of the film and, uh, oh, that's really cool. That's really, really cool. Really cool. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, because totally. it's, I mean, do you feel, I mean, not that you needed it, but it almost kind of adds that, just that voice, just there's a certain gravitas that comes, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and you know it's it's interesting. I mean, people hear different pe people hear a, a a British male narrator in many different ways, but yeah. I do think it has some gravitas. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, he is from Nigeria, so it's it's he's not quite the colonizer that he might sound like. Um, <laughs> but boy, his voice. Yeah. I don't know. I, it, to me, it's, yeah, I'm just like, I just will believe whatever you say, David. Yeah, exactly. It's just this, <laughs> those dulcet tones, you know, when it, when, it, when we first started talking, I was like, wait a minute, I, I know that voice. Who's, <laughs> you know, and yeah. uh, no, it's uh, very, very, well, that's great. I think it, it, yet again, something else that adds adds to this film. So uh, uh, do, again, recommend, do check it out. Um, and what's next for you um, after this project? Oh, well, I'm, uh, my PBS show is kind of going from a smaller series to a much bigger series. Um, oh. So I'll be in the Arctic this summer. I'll be chasing fires again. I'll wow. be um, chasing hurricanes. And so, yeah, some storm chasing and just deep climate reporting on location um, for a series that comes out Earth Day next year um, on PBS. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, that's, totally. That sounds that sounds really cool, and uh, you know, when your when your is it your child or your son is a, a bit older, he's going to be like my dad chases uh, <laughs> chases hurricanes and fights fires and does all kinds of really cool stuff. I have this like yeah, and and I just all I want to do is like bring him with me. You know, that's clearly not happening. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I just he's so fun to hang out with. I'm just like, oh, you'd like this, Arlo. Yeah. And then I'm like, oh, wait, it's going to be like 30 degrees in August in the Arctic. Right. I don't know. Maybe not. But he loves snuggling with his polar bear, and we won't be snuggling with him, but hopefully we'll be seeing them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, well good luck with that, and look forward to, to seeing that when it comes out. And um, yes, just to, just wanted to thank you again, Tripp, for, uh, for being on the uh, podcast and educating us about forest fires, wildfires, whatever we want to call them grass fires and uh wild and, fires, and, yeah yes wildfires <laughs> and giving us hope for uh that there are there are solutions to these sort yeah. of or, or things we can at least do to 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 lessen or make things better so thanks again so much we really uh just remind you we've been talking with trip jennings the director and writer of elemental uh it's a uh, theatrical release uh currently We'll be streaming on all the main uh, channels uh, or platforms, I should say, in the June sometime. And also check out the website, elementalfilm.com. Thanks again. 
I also would like to thank those who helped make this podcast possible. A big shout out to Sam and Joe at Intersound Audio in York, England. A big thanks to Amy Ord, our podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show and that everything otherwise runs smoothly. Finally, a big thanks to our listeners. Many of you have been with us for four incredible seasons. Please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. Please also remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.